Hi everyone, Spiceman here from Airwing 11. In this video, we'll take a little deeper dive into a K3 recovery and look at some of the fundamentals involved in a successful instrument approach. Let's get started. All right, here we are. We're in the jet. We are 68 miles from the boat. We've got our landing checklist complete. Um, so this is kind of where you want to be when you check in with Marshall. You should be checking in with Marshall between 50 and 70 miles or so um, from the boat. No later than 50. And you want to have the airplane all set up when you do that. You want to have your landing checklist complete which we've got here I got the hookup because I'm going to do a uh, touch and go uh, the first pass you want to have your tack in and your ILS um, tuned and and boxed you want to have your frequencies set um, you know one of the key aspects of instrument flying is task management you don't want to have to be doing multiple things at once you want to anticipate what's coming next and be set up for it it really is about managing um, your workload um, when you talk about instrument flying all right so you get all set up before um, you contact marshall and contact marshall um, in plenty of time closer to 70 than than 50. so here we are flying along we're all set up to land, um, and we're going to go ahead and and call Marshall. Let's fast forward a little bit. Oh, before we do that, though, let's talk about what the NATOP says about um, Case 3 approaches. That is the governing document when it comes to um, operations around the boat. Uh, so one of the things that it says is that, you know, section approaches, um, you don't normally do section approaches an instrument flying you can arrive as a section you can check in with marshall as a section um, but marshall will split you up at that point uh, each airplane in the section will be given separate um, marshall instructions you normally do not marshal or perform section approaches um, in instrument conditions um, the other thing to notice here is um, what it says about where um, where you should be marshaled so Normally, um, you'll marshal uh, 180 degrees relative to your expected final bearing. It could be 20 degrees off of that. If marshal is expecting any kind of a straight-in approach for whatever reason, whether it be um, there might be an emergency, inbound, or whatever, marshal can marshal you 20 degrees off of that um, final bearing. Uh, so, but uh, according to the the NATOPS, uh, primarily if you can marshal 180 degrees relative to final bearing, that's where you want to do it. And you're going to marshal a mile for every feet, every thousand feet of altitude plus 15 miles. So basically, it's a stack of airplanes uh, at a thousand foot increments and um, one mile separated. So the, the, the lowest, the first airplane to check in will normally be um, marshaled at uh, at 6,000 feet, um, 21 miles um, back of the boat, and then it'll stack up from that. 6,021 miles, 7,022 miles, 8,023 miles, etc. on up. Um, holding pattern is a left-hand pattern. Unless otherwise documented, all holding patterns are left-hand patterns. Right? That's kind of a universal thing. Um, and you want to try and fly a six minute racetrack pattern. They normally, you know, you hit the, the uh, holding fix, turn outbound three minutes, um, turn back inbound for a six minute racetrack pattern. And the inbound leg will pass over the holding fix. So it's when you're inbound to the holding fix is when you want to be on that, um, that radial that you're given 
by Marshall. And we'll look at that a little bit more in detail here in a little bit. And, I, and as I mentioned, um, the lowest holding altitude uh, is 6,000 feet. That's where you'll, where you'll start the stack. All right. Uh, let's see what else um, the NATOP says about um, along the lines of limiting workload during instrument conditions. Well, NATOPS directs air traffic control to sort of follow that paradigm as well. Um, air traffic control should make every effort not to have you marshalling in instrument conditions. Marshalling should always be in visual conditions, if at all practical. Um, if you check in to marshal and you're below an overcast, marshal should not have you climbing through an overclass, overcast to marshal, um, if at all possible. Um, even if it's below 6,000 feet, if air traffic control um, can uh, do it safely, uh, they should marshal you even below 6,000 feet if it means not having you um, climb above uh, an overcast layer. So air traffic control should be limiting um, your workload as well. Uh, they don't normally have you change frequencies in instrument conditions. You want to do that either before or after um, arriving or leaving in instrument conditions. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, fixed wing aircrafts will be separated a thousand feet vertically in, uh, in Marshall typically. Um, and the marshalling airspeed you know, a lot of folks just assume, you know, oh, we'll do 250 knots, um, but that's not actually mandated. You can marshal at any airspeed um, that you deem appropriate according to um, either the aircraft's, you know, capabilities or its NATOPS manual or, or whatever. You do not have to be at 250 knots in the marshal. Um, it's not a bad, bad airspeed to pick. You have to descend at 250 knots. Why make yourself, you know, sort of adjust, you know, for the descent? So marshalling at 250 knots is perfectly fine. Just the point is that you're not required to marshal at 250 knots. So um, let's see what else the NATOP says about case three approaches. Um, you should depart the marshal pattern at your assigned time. And if you are not going to make your assigned time, you need to let Marshall know so that Marshall can adjust the airplanes either in front of you or behind you based on um, your, how late or early you are and they can keep uh, the spacing um, in the pattern. Um, normally, you will be given instruction to depart um, Marshall one minute ap apart. That can be changed by air traffic control. It's not written in stone. It's just sort of normally if we're training or what have you and we're still just trying to practice and get good at it, there's no reason why we can't be given um, martial instructions to depart two minutes apart just to give us a little bit of extra um, room to play with while we're all you know, sort of training and getting used to things. But typically it'll be um, one minute apart. Let's see what else it says here. So, um, yeah, the descent at 250 knots. So you depart the Marshall stack. You're going to descend at 250 knots and 4,000 feet per minute uh, until you reach platform. Platform is 5,000 feet. So when you get to 5,000 feet, you're going to shallow that descent to 2,000 feet per minute. Um, and you're going to level off at 10,000 feet. We'll look at the approach plate here in a second. You're going to level off at 10,000 feet. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to level off at 1,200 feet um, by the time you're at 10 nautical miles DME. Uh, and then you're going to dirty up at 8 nautical miles, typically. Um, now, air traffic control can have you dirty up early. Let's say you're getting close to the airplane um, in front of you. One common way that air traffic control um, might fix that or address that is to tell you to dirty up a little bit early just to get you slower um, for spacing reasons, but unless otherwise directed, um, you want to dirty up at eight nautical miles. Um, now, another point that the NATOPS makes um, is that if you're not marshalling on your final bearing, as soon as you get 20 nautical mile DME, you can correct to that final bearing. I've seen um, some videos where folks say, you know, you fly to um, to 12 miles and do a 12 
mile arc. Well, that's not what the NATOP says, and that's not really how you want to do it. As soon as you hit that 20 nautical mile DME, make your correction onto your final bearing. There's no reason to wait um, until 12 miles and then have all that extra workload of trying to fly an arc and, and all that. What the NATOP says is that you can correct to that final bearing at 20 nautical miles. If you're only 10 degrees off the final bearing or closer, you can make a pretty gradual um, correction. But if you're more than 10 degrees off of that final bearing, make a good healthy um, 30 degree um, correction. Right, And then what the NATOP says is if you are not on that final bearing by the time you get to 12 nautical miles, which you should be, but if you're not, then you fly a 12 mile arc until you are on the final bearing. But ideally, um, you should be on that final bearing well before you get to that 12 nautical mile point. Again, make your life easy. Make that correction. Get on your final bearing um, early as possible and not add to your workload close in um, by having all that extra work to do. So, so that's that. Uh, let's see what Delston Atops tells us. So here's our, here's our approach plate. It's, um, it's called, the correct term is the uh, initial, um, or rather the instrument approach procedure, the IAP. But so this kind of shows um, graphically everything uh, that we just talked about. It's a standard format. All instrument approach procedures um, have the same format. There's a plan view and a profile view, right? So the plan view, what this tells us is that this is your Marshall stack, right? This is your holding pattern. Um, two common points in every instrument approach is the initial approach fix and the final approach fix. Um, the initial approach fix is the point um, in the Marshall stack where we leave and commence the approach. Initial approach fix is where the, commence, where the approach commences. Right, so the instructions that Marshall is giving you is this holding pattern, and this initial approach fix is the point that Marshall uh, gives you when you check in. They give you this point in space, this initial approach fix. It'll be on a um, bearing line uh, from mother, right, on a on a tack and course from mother at its DME, and that point in space is your initial approach fix. Right, and so what the chart is telling us is that we hold, right, we depart the initial approach fix at the time um, Marshall gives us. This FB is final bearing. We then correct to the final bearing, um, and then we fly inbound on the final bearing from that point. And there are points delineated on the approach procedure of 10 miles, 6 miles, and 3 miles um, DME. Now, what else this tells us is that if we bolter or wave off, um, then we're expected to turn on the 180 by the time we reach four miles DME. It also tells us that um, on instrument procedures in a case three, if you bolt or you don't correct onto the base recovery course, you maintain that final bearing on a wave off or a bolter. And then you turn downwind at four miles DME or after two minutes, unless otherwise instructed by air traffic control. All right, so the other thing the uh, um, plan form tells us is platform is 5,000 feet, like the NATOP said. This is your profile view, right? Um, so initial approach fix, correct the final bearing, fly the final bearing, you were expected. Now this um, symbol here says that you need to be at 1200 feet. This is what the line above and the line below say that you need to be at 1200 feet. If it was no lower than 1200 feet, there'd just be a line below. If it was no higher than 1200 feet, it's a line above. A line above and below says you need to be at 1200 feet by 10 miles DME. And then you're expected to fly the final bearing from 10 DME to 3 DME. And then this point here, this symbol on any approach um, procedure is the, the symbol for your final approach fix. That's the other point on a approach procedure is your final approach fix. The final approach fix can be defined as a, a point in space. Uh, maybe it's, it could be a DME uh, as it is here. 
uh, it can be at, unless otherwise specified, it be at glide slope intercept is considered to be the final approach fix. Um, civilian approach procedures often use um, uh, a radial off of off of a VMR or a VOR or perhaps an intersection of two radials off two other VMRs. It can be defined in, in several ways, but um, uh, this symbol here is our final approach fix. Uh, and this uh, tells us that after a wave off or a bolter, we need to be again at 1200 feet uh, and at 4 DME, we turn down when unless otherwise instructed. Uh, this down here is another standard part of any instrument procedure, and it gives you your minimums. This is the lowest point you can descend to until you have, unless you have the landing environment in sight. The landing environment being the runway, the, um, the approach lights. Uh, as, if you can determine where the correct place is to land, you have the, um, the the landing environment in sight, but you can descend no lower than this point under these conditions that it outlines. So for example, if we're flying an ICLS approach with just the ILS and no ACLS, which, that's what we normally fly in, in DCS. They really don't have ACLS implemented yet in the, in the Hornet. Um, or on the uh, the carrier that we have now. So we typically fly ICLS approaches, which means that after at 3 DME, we we should have the needles at that point. 3 DME is roughly when that glide slope needle will be centered. And then we fly down that um, glide slope and we can descend to 360 feet or three quarters of a mile. Basically you descend until you get the ball call. If you don't have the ball call, um, if you get the ball call and you don't see the ball, if you can't, if you don't have the runway, the landing environment in sight, well, then you have to wave off. You have to go around. So that's what this is telling us. Um, now, when we do have ACLS um, and we are flying a mode 1A approach or a mode uh, 2 approach, mode 1 is the one where you're, you know, you're coupled, you're fully automatic to touchdown. Uh, 1A you fly coupled until um, the pilot will uncouple no later than uh, seeing the ball. You can uncouple earlier, but mode 1A, the pilot uncouples prior to touchdown. Mode 2, you get the ACLS needles, but you don't couple. You simply use the ACLS needles as your um, uh, azimuth and glide slope um, guidance. But under that approach, if you have uh, lock on from ACLS and you have those needles, uh, you can fly to 260 feet or half a mile. Um, this uh, also with um, with PALS. PALS is the uh, uh, instructor or the uh, voice-led um, uh, approach using ACLS. Uh, same set of conditions there, 260 feet, half mile. Now, um, if you're flying a uh, what they call um, a, no, a non-precision approach. A non-precision approach is where you do not have vertical guidance. You only have lateral guidance. So you do not have the glide slope. Either you can have the ILS and the glide slope is an operative. You cannot have the ILS and you're simply doing it based on the TACAN. Now, in those cases, um, uh, that's what we call in the civilian world a dive and drive, right? So you get to three nautical miles, DME, you descend smartly down to 600 feet, you level off there, and you wait for the landing environment to appear. Um, if it doesn't, then you wave yourself off. Um, not wave yourself off, you go missed approach. Um, so the vertical limits for that is 600 feet and a mile and a quarter visibility. So those are the conditions you need to fly these approaches. So that's, yeah, that's what the uh, NATOPS is telling us there with the chart. So back to the airplane. Here we are, um, 63 miles now, getting ready to uh, check in with Marshall. We've got some recordings um, off the internet there. We'll hear um, Marshall start talking here in just a second. We'll hear her give uh, uh, 
the weather conditions for the boat and we'll hear some other planes check in and then we'll check in ourselves so so what you're going to hear Marshall give you is um, the Marshall will give you know the NATOPS tells Marshall that um, prior to any approach Marshall needs to give out this information um, to the aircraft uh, involved in the recovery and we'll hear um, the Marshall controller give out these instructions first, so broadcast it in the 99 broadcast. Bearing three, three, recovery, CD1 approach, expected final bearing 331. Three, Mother's weather, a few at 1,000, few at 1, 2,000. Ceiling at 20,000, broken facility 7. Altimeter 3001. Blue water ops, tank as follows. Rhino tank 4.1. Hornet tank 3.5. Power tank 4.6. She gave a time hack later in the recording. I just did catch it for this video. But. So what you just heard there is give an airplane checking in this point, right? This initial approach fix. He said, um, uh, Marshall Mothers uh, 170 for 23. Um, Angels 15, I think it was. Or I'm sorry, Angels um, 8. Uh, and so she gave this point. In her instructions as the as the holding fix and she also gave the um, expected departure time for that holding fix that's what she's given there and that when you check in so as each airplane checks in in turn, she's creating the Marshall stack. First one's 6,000 feet, second one's 7, 8, 9, 10. So she'll, she'll stack them up in altitude and out uh, in distance as they check in. So now here we are checking in. Check in, um, tell approach controller where we are and our fuel state. So we would check in Marshall um, 203 Mothers 120 for 54, Angels 25, uh, and our fuel state 7.4. And she's going to respond with our, she would respond with our Marshall instructions. So she's telling us to Marshall at Mother's 170. Now, you, you may or may not have noticed when that first um, plane checked in and she gave the instructions, I set the um, approach course at that time. Again, on the on the whole paradigm of limiting your workload, right? Um, why why wait to set that um, that Marshall course? When I heard another plane, that other plane check in, she gave them instructions. I set that 170 in there. At that time, I knew I'm going to get the same, you know, bearing. You know, why why wait? As soon as I heard that, I I set my my final bearing there into my tack amp. But yeah, so she's given us. Uh, 170 for 25 angels 10. She's given us the final approach course of 331 and told us to depart that initial approach fix at uh, time 38. And then she's also given us our um, approach frequency. All right, so we've got our instructions and now we're going to um, descend smartly to our um, holding altitude. Um, the rule there is that you should be at your holding altitude and on your holding speed by the time you're within 20 degrees of that um, holding uh, course, right? So our holding course is 170 or 350, right? So by the time we get to 330 on here to mother, we should be at our assigned altitude and at our intended airspeed uh, by the time we get there. You're within 20 degrees of that um, holding uh, course. You should be at the right altitude and on the right airspeed. So we're going to descend smartly to our holding altitude here of 10,000 feet, and then we're going to turn inbound. I think I skipped forward in time here just to go through the boring parts. All right, so here we are turning onto our final um, 
approach course. Now let's talk about entering holding patterns, you know, sort of the right way. There's a right way and a wrong way to enter a holding pattern. So this kind of symbolizes the holding pattern that we've got here. This is our initial approach fix that the Marshall controller gave us. Draw a line perpendicular here by the book. It's actually like a 70 degree line, but just make it easier on yourself. Draw a parallel or rather a perpendicular line to your inbound holding course here. Now, if you're on coming in from anywhere in this direction, right, it's called a direct entry into the holding pattern. So fly to that inbound course, intercept that inbound course, and then fly to the initial approach fix if you're coming in anywhere from this direction. Now, a holding pattern has a holding side and a non-holding side. So the holding radial is here, right? This is the holding side. This is the non-holding side. The idea here is that the holding side is the safe side. The non-holding side is the unsafe side, right? Air traffic control's responsibility is to keep airplanes separated and they're, and they're assuming that you're going to remain on the holding side, uh, which you should do. So now draw again that parallel line. If you're coming from this direction here, you want to fly what's called a teardrop entry. Um, so you fly, you cross that um, holding radial, and then you're going to fly 30 degrees outbound from that. We're 170 here. So if I was coming in from this direction, I'd cross this line, I'd fly out a heading of 210 for a minute, and then I would do a 180 onto the, um, the holding uh, radial. All right, so that's what you do if you're coming in this direction. Now, since this is not a defined point in space, it's not a waypoint or whatever, you might be, wind you're gonna make your best guess, your best judgment, but you might be coming in over here, you might be coming in over here, but regardless, it's still the same. You cross that, with that 170 radial, you're going to turn 210 for a minute, and then you're going to turn in, uh, intercept that 170 radial to your initial approach fix. If you're coming in from this direction, it's called a parallel entry. So you're coming from this direction, you'd cross that 170 radial from the boat, and then you'd turn parallel to it. You would turn out to, um, to 170, right? And then you would, for a minute, and then you would turn inbound make a right hand turn inbound remember you want to stay on the holding side so a right turn inbound for 210 degrees right so in this case it'd be three to zero two zero right uh, to the remember the inbound is three five uh, zero so you want to turn the 30 degree cut to that so you would turn into zero two zero pick up that um, that holding course and then fly inbound to the initial approach fix those are the three proper ways to enter a holding pattern, direct, teardrop, or parallel. All right, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, I'm a direct entry into here, into the holding pattern, um, the way that I'm coming in. So I've turned um, onto that uh, 170 from the boat, or which is 3502 of the boat. Um, and when I established on that course, I call Marshall and I say established. That's one of the required reporting points according to the NATOPS is when you're established on that um, final approach fix. So uh, the other required points to, uh, to call is um, when you're commencing, uh, if you have to change altitudes, um, if you uh, um, have to change, whenever you're changing frequencies, you're expected to tell air traffic. When you've reached platform, you're expected to call air traffic with a platform call at 10 miles DME. Um, you're expected to call when you're coupled um, with the needles. That's if you're on an ACLS approach. Uh, when that, when you're, when the ACLS is locked on to you. Um, you're supposed to report um, the needles. Um, if you're not, if a, when an ICLS approach, which is what we fly um, in DCS 99% of the time, um, you do not have to make a needles call. It's only, it's an ACLS thing making the needles call. And the reason that they do that 
is not necessarily because they're checking for the accuracy of the needles. They're making sure that they've got the right plane locked up. That um, that ACLS um, can lock two planes at a time. It operates on two different channels. And one of the reasons that you make that they make that needles call is to confirm that um, the ACLS is locked up and um, on the on the correct aircraft. It's one of the main reasons for that. And for ICLS, it's not. That's not a thing, right? So you don't have to um, make a needles call if you're purely on an ICLS approach. Um, the other call you should make is the ball call, of course. And then um, if you're if you're waving off, um, you should make a call back to the approach controller because you're you're kind of handed off back to them if you're waving off. And then um, if you're in the bolter pattern. Uh, you want to call a beam of the boat. That's the other required call uh, that you need to make. So here we are. Uh, we've established inbound on our on our um, holding um, radial. So we make an established call with the fuel state. All right. So we're going to proceed inbound to 25 miles. That's our um, holding fix. So here we are, at 25 miles. And so what? I'm going to do here is our time is our approach time is 38. We're at uh, we're at 23 here, right? So we've got um, 14 or so, a little over 14 minutes to go. So we're going to make at least we're going to make two turns um, in the holding pattern, and during those two turns, we want to adjust our time to leave at uh, time 38. But here we are. We're at 25 miles. I'm going to use the elapsed time function on the uh, UFC and the HUD. Kind of one of the easier ways to do it. Put it on the HUD instead of having to look down, you know, an instrument flying. You don't want to have to move your head a lot. So it, it, it is best to use the uh, the display on the HUD, really. But I'm going to use the elapsed time display to time my turns. Um, the elapsed time display does have a countdown clock as well. Um, if you want to use that, you know, everybody's going to have a different technique. All of our brains work in different ways. So whatever works for you as a way to time these turns, you know, just use use whatever works for you. Practice it, figure out what works for you um, and use it. There is no magic algorithm that exists out there that says, you know, exactly follow these exact steps and you're going to wind up leaving on time. As I said, all of our brains work differently. Just use whatever technique works for you, but just practice it and, and figure it out. I'm going through here what works for me, right? So so we're approaching that 25 miles. Uh, we're going to start our first holding turn outbound, and I'm going to start the elapsed timer um, on the HUD. And then we're going to turn outbound. We're going to do a left-hand turn um, to the to the uh, outbound, which in our case would be uh, 170. Now I'm going to correct a little bit on this turn. Um, uh, our final approach course is 330, which is kind of off to our right. And assuming the wind is going to be coming from that direction, the wind should be pushing me away from the boat, should be pushing me downwind, and it also should be pushing me to the left. So in my turn here, I make a, a correction to the right, and I'm going to turn to uh, 175. Right. And I'm going to try that, and I'm going to see how that works, and I'll adjust based on my results. But So I'm going to make a turn out to the reciprocal. That turn should take uh, a minute and a half or so. Um, a little something on turns. So the standard rate of turn in instrument flying is called a two minute turn. Um, that's what the, your turn coordinator typically gives you down here on the turn coordinator. This isn't implemented um, in the Hornet, but um, when the uh, when that two minute turn indicator would be on this mark there, it would be a, a two minute turn. And that's what you kind of do in the civilian world and instrument procedures is a two minute turn. Um, usually. Now, there's a rule of thumb 
in, in instrument flying. Pilots use a lot of rules of thumb only because pilots don't like to have to do math when you're when you're flying. And one of the rules of thumb for a two minute turn is the angle of bank required. The angle of bank for a two minute turn uh, is 20% of your airspeed. So, um, so for example, at 250 knots, a two minute turn would take 50 degrees angle of bank. The way that you figure it out is just knock off the zero, which is 25, that's 10%, and then double it, so that's 50. So to do an actual two minute turn, a standard instrument turn, would take 50 degrees angle of bank. So what like airlines typically do is do half standard turns. They'll do one minute, or rather three minute um, instrument turns. So I know that since our max angle of bank in instrument conditions in the Hornet uh, is 30 degrees, you should be using no more than 30 degrees angle of bank. And a 50 degree angle of bank is what I need for a two minute turn. Um, this is going to be, you know, um, somewhat less than a half turn here is going to be more than a minute. It's going to take about a, a minute and a half. So that's probably going to be where we wind up after a 30 degree angle of bank turn at 250 knots is about a minute and a half or so. So. So I've turned outbound on my reciprocal. I've leveled off. It's about a minute and a half, right? And I'm going to ride that out to three minutes. Um, and then I'm going to turn inbound. Let's fast forward a little bit here. There's 208, 241. So when I hit three minutes outbound, I'll turn inbound. Now without accounting for the wind, that would be um, a six minute pattern, but we'll see what I what we wind up with turning inbound at three minutes here. All right, so there I am turning inbound. Fast forward a little bit. And we are flying back inbound, picking up our course. 32 miles out, oops, 30 miles out, 27 miles out, so this looks like turning back in at three minutes results in, it looks like it'll be about a six and a half minute um, holding pattern here for us. So now what um, I do knowing that, I've got my first bit of data here, right? So um, our holding pattern, turn around the pattern for us is about six and a half minutes, all right? And I've got, I want to be off the holding pattern at 38. So I've got, what's that, seven uh, minutes and 45 seconds um, left to go here, right? So knowing that, so knowing if I turn inbound at three minutes, it takes about a six and a half minute turn uh, pattern. Um, that's my data point now. So now when I correct um, inbound this time, I'm going to want to stretch this out a little about a minute more than that, a little over a minute more than that, right? So uh, I'll turn back inbound, not at three minutes, but three and a half, right? Um, actually, probably a little bit less than three and a half, knowing that the wind is blowing me outbound, right? It's going to take me longer to come back than it is to go out. So I'll probably shave 10 seconds off of that or so and turn inbound at uh, 320, 325, something like that. So I used um, the statistics from my first turn around the holding pattern to now correct uh, for my second and final turn around. So here I am turning outbound. Another minute and a half turn. Fly outbound. There's two and a half minutes. There's 308. I think I turned in at 320, uh, maybe 325, but Uh, 
No, I guess I did go to tool 330. That's right, because I, I did have to go a little bit more than um, a minute correction. It was like a minute 15. So I turned inbound at 330. All right, so I'm turning inbound. All right. Get through the inbound turn. Now, the other thing I can use when I'm coming inbound to correct here is that my ground speed here, right? So here's my HSI. The number on the left here is telling me I'm doing 240, 294 knots of ground speed. It's pretty close to 300, which is five miles a minute, right? So I can look to compare my time at uh, 30 and 35 miles, right? At 35 miles, I've got two minutes to go at this ground speed. At 30 miles, I've got one minute to go. So I can look at those numbers on my inbound here um, and adjust my airspeed if I have to um, to get all my numbers, right? So I'm getting close to uh, 35 miles here, which is a good first checkpoint here. At 35 miles, I should be at time 36 down here if I'm right on time. So I hit 35 miles here, and I've got, uh, I'm at 35.40. So I'm a little bit long here. So uh, I can speed up. I can just goose it, right? Go 10, 20 knots faster for a little bit, and then bring it back down. And, uh, and then when I'm at my 30 nautical miles, kind of check again, see how that did as far as correcting um, my time. So I gave it a little goose on the throttle and back to 250 and then see where I am at 30 miles. Thirty miles I should be at time thirty-seven. The other thing I'm doing now here is setting my final approach course, All right? Uh, get that done, get it out of the way. And I'm also calling inbound, you know, to the boat. I know that I'm on final approach course, so I'm going to stay this heading. So, you know, there's no sense in having that up there anymore. I went ahead and um, reduced my workload later and set my final approach course at this point. I also noticed that at 30 miles I was still a little short, so I goosed it a little bit again. I got distracted a little bit and let myself get a little bit slow, but I'll fix that here in a second. But it worked out. Here we are coming up on 25 um, nautical miles, and we're at 37.52, so it worked out almost perfect. And I'm getting ready to commence, so I call 203 commencing and with my fuel state. 37.55, not too shabby. So, <clears throat> so we begin sending smartly. Now, um, throttles to idle. I put the speed brakes out. Now, what I found out here is it looks to be a flight model thing recently. Um, I found out that I cannot um, do 4,000 feet per minute descent, even with the sp speed brakes fully out without exceeding 250 knots. And I know that in previous um, DCS versions, um, all I needed was just a tiny bit of speed brakes to stay at 250 knots. Here, with this current flight model, throttles to idle, speed brakes are all the way out, and I can't maintain 4,000 feet per minute without the airspeed Altitude. shooting way up. Altitude. So that's a flight model thing. You should be able to do that, and maybe they'll fix that in the future, I'm guessing. But um, So anyway, anyway, I get to 5,000 feet, uh, and I call platform, and I'll shallow my descent 
to 2,000 feet per minute. Try and get it back to 250 knots. Now the other thing I'm doing, I fit 20 miles, I can start my correction to my final approach course, which is 331. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, turning a good 30 degree cut into that. for a little bit. Now I've leveled off at 1,200 feet, 250 knots. Still correcting onto that final approach course. Press for a little bit again. So you can see <clears throat> uh, maneuver pretty ag ag Aggressively, I'm on the final approach course at 14 miles here, so I don't have to worry about uh, flying that 12 mile arc. So keep heading inbound. Approaching the 10 mile point. 10 miles is where I am required to be at 1200 feet by that point which I am. Make my 10 mile call. Keep pressing in. Oh, here I am, hit eight nautical miles, um, 30 and up. Again, I'm leaving my hook up because my first one here is a touch and go. My main focus at this point is um, trying to maintain my altitude while slowing down and getting dirtied up here so get on speed and now what I'm trying to do is find that sweet spot where is that throttle sweet spot where I only need a millimeter or two either way to hold my altitude Got a little low, but I'm correcting. All right, so there's six miles. You should have both needles by the time you're at six miles. Four and a half. Approaching three miles. At three miles is roughly where um, you should be intercepting the glide slope. And ideally you can uh, start seeing the boat at that point. It's just a dot at this point, but it's still a reference point. So, uh, so yeah, so here we are at our three DME point, right? 1200 feet. And this is where now the chart tells you what you can do from this point on. We're in an ICLS approach. That tells us from this point on, I can descend down to 360 feet or three quarters of a mile. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna fly the needles down to 360 feet. Um, if I've got the landing environment in sight, I'm allowed to land. If I don't, I have to go around. So now what you do it, uh, what I do anyway, on the glide slope, is I just have my imaginary horizon down here at the three degree point. And I, I let the airplane sort of naturally porpoise. The airplane naturally wants to porpoise around a point. I don't struggle and fight it. You know, I just kind of let it porpoise a little bit naturally, um, which the airplane is, any airplane is want to do. I don't, I don't struggle and fight for every single correction. Just let the airplane do its thing. Flying is more art than science. So here we are on the glide slope 1.0. We're still talking to the approach controller at this point. We're not, uh, we're not talking to um, the LSO. Now the approach controller 
uh, hand you over to the LSO. So it's the approach controller will say, you know, two zero three three quarter mile, call the ball, and then you call the ball. And now the LSO takes over from that point forward. You've been handed off effectively from the approach controller to the LSO. Now the landing lights did not come on for me. I, I could have swore I did everything right when I called the boat, but I did not get landing lights. Um, oh well. But um, I'm touching and going here on purpose. All right. So now I'm going to maintain that uh, final approach course and climb to 1,200 feet. I stay in the dirty configuration, wheels down, flaps down. I call the boat again to turn the lights back on, even though they didn't come on the first time. But All right, so now we're in the wave off or the bolter pattern. So let's look at what the NATOPS tells us about that, right? So if you miss or wave off or bolter, you climb straight ahead on the extended final bearing to 1,200 feet and wait for instructions from approach control. You don't really have to call them. They know they should see what you're doing and and call you, right? Um, if you don't, and the other point that NATOPS makes is that all um, turns in the case three pattern are level turns. So you don't want to make any turn until you have leveled yourself out at 1200 feet. Now, if you don't hear from the approach controller, by the time you get to four DME or within two minutes, you call the approach controller, right? Make contact with them, tell them you're at 1200 feet, four DME, you know, just wake them up. <laughs> um, they might get, they might be busy, right? Um, now, if, if you still don't hear anything, you assume your communications are out and you just turn downwind, um, right? So that's what the NATOPS tells us to do. And if you still don't hear anything, um, you're going to report your, your beam. If you still don't hear anything, um, you're going to turn to the final approach course at, at, um, at uh, I think it's, uh, bu -bu -bu. It's back down here. I think by when you get to five miles or four miles DME, you're supposed to turn back um, inbound. But that's what you do um, in the uh, in the bolter pattern, right? So I'm going to climb and level off here at 1,200 feet. Now approach control is watching me, so they're going to. So I got a call here. Uh, climb maintain angels 1.2 after reaching angels 1.2. Left turn heading 150. That's kind of typically what you'll hear from the approach controller after a bolter or a wave off. I acknowledge that. I also put my hook down, I'm gonna land next time. Right. So I'm gonna to climb to 1200 and then turn downwind. Pour a little bit, 1200, I'm turning downwind. Fast forward. Turn to 150. Head out some more. And there I am, a beam of the boat. I think at this point, I should be, uh, when you see your DME stop changing, uh, you know you're a beam. And just call, approach, tell me you're a beam. And your fuel state, as, the, as always. And I think uh, I go out to about five miles, turn me inbound, left 360 to intercept the glide slope. It's the instructions approach gave me. So I'll turn back in and intercept the final approach course and do it all again. Five miles, four miles, three miles. Here comes the glide slope. Move my imaginary horizon line down to the three degree pitch. There's the boat. Not much more than a dot at this point, but it's a good 
point of reference. Very small corrections, both in azimuth and elevation. Again, I don't fight the airplane's natural tendency to porpoise around a uh, uh, a point. Right, kind of let it let it do its thing. Approach controller tells me to call the ball. I call the ball and the LSO responds. The LSO is on the same frequency as the approach controller on the boat. Still don't have landing lights. I don't know, don't know why. Um, but proceed. So there we go. Bingo. Bingo. Turn my goggles on at this point so I can see what I'm doing. Not a great on center, but not too bad without lights, I guess. Um, and then taxi off. So, so there you go. I hope you uh, enjoyed this little deeper look at um, a Case 3 instrument approach and that it uh, helps you um, along the way. Um, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.